Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us, and in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace through God, through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Glorious God, your generous waters the world with goodness, and you cover creation with abundance. Awaken in us a hunger for the food that satisfies both body and spirit. And with this food, fill all the starving world through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. First reading is from Isaiah. Ho, everyone who thirst, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Combine wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader to, and commander of the peoples. See, you shall call nation that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, or the Lord has glorified you. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our psalm is Psalm 145. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Lord, you are good to all, and your compassion is over all your works. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up those who are bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon you, O Lord, and you give them their food in due season. You open wide your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. You are righteous in all your ways and loving in all your works. You are near to all who call upon you, to all who call upon you faithfully. You fulfill the desire of those who fear you. You hear their cry and save them. You watch over all those who love you, but all the wicked you shall destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. Let all flesh bless God's holy name forever and ever. A reading from Romans. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the, adaptation, the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, 
the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus heard about the beheading of John the Baptist, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured the sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. As I was preparing for this week, the reading from Isaiah kind of captured my imagination. I know we just had the second half of this chapter not too long ago, but I couldn't help but think that there was some tendencies or loose connections between what Isaiah is going through and where we find ourselves in the present. Now, I want to be careful when I say that I find some connections because we live in completely different times than the ancient Israelites did. They found themselves in exile in Babylon, and we are definitely not in exile. We have modern conveniences, they don't. We don't even speak the same language. And so even though there are some connections, there is still a kind of a great distance between our time and theirs. And so it's not just as simple as kind of putting the lessons in what Isaiah have to, has to say to the people into our time and place. But I think that Isaiah maybe perhaps gives us some direction for our current time and place and some guidance. Isaiah, as I mentioned, is talking to the exiles. It comes towards the end of their time in exile. And we don't really know a whole lot about this Isaiah. Oftentimes this Isaiah gets called second Isaiah because we don't even know his or her name. Most likely it was a him, but it's possible that it could have been a, a she because we simply don't know. People who had been disciples of Isaiah had kind of continued sort of with his thoughts through the exile and beyond. And so this is sort of, think of this as kind of like the second movement to a three movement book. And today's reading comes from the end of that second movement. And the second movement really takes place towards the end of the people's time in exile. And so why we don't know for sure, it would seem quite probable, but at the very least possible, that this writer, this second Isaiah, would have known about the king's release from captivity. King Jehoiachin had been taken into Babylonian captivity as a prisoner as a prisoner of war. Some years after, he had been released. 
and now finds himself dining in the palace of the Babylonian king on a nightly basis. And Isaiah, as well as the people, probably understand that this has happened. And so there might have been, again, it would be speculation, but there might have been either some kind of movement or hope that the Davidic line would once again rule from Jerusalem, that they would reestablish the country and the city, and the Davidic dynasty would once again reign supreme on the throne in Jerusalem. But Isaiah, second Isaiah, understands that this can't happen. Whether or not there was actually kind of a movement afoot or even a sentiment along those lines, he sees clearly and I think understands that the Davidic dynasty was largely responsible for the people finding themselves in exile. It was a result of that line and their sort of refusal or apostasy towards God that led the country and though and his countrymen and his fellow people into exile in Babylon in the first place. And so to simply return to that kind of hope that a Davidic descendant or a messianic descendant would find himself on the throne once again is to put one's faith in the wrong place. Isaiah recognizes that we can't go back to the way that we can't go back to the way things were. Their world has changed. But that presents sort of another problem. Because there was probably a long-held tradition in the central piece of their identity as, as Israelites were the promises that God had made to David. Promises about sort of a, being a dynasty forever, that God would work through David and descendants so that the people would know what God is doing in the world. As Isaiah reminds the people, David was a witness, a leader, and a commander of the peoples one who essentially led them, commanded them, and witnessed to them about God's ways in the world, God's purpose, and God's intent. And so he can't just get rid of that long-held tradition, even though the institution he needs to sort of discard. And here, I think, is where we see the genius of the second Isaiah because he takes what had been made to David, those promises, and he transfers it to the people. He had been working on this throughout much of this kind of second movement in terms of the suffering servant. But here we see it, the first time that David is mentioned in this second movement, sort of that transference of God's promises from, and God's purpose from David to the people. And this allows them to see that God, to see the new ways that God is fulfilling those divine promises and the divine purpose. And there's where I think we can connect to our own time. We don't find ourselves in a world of exile, at least not on a political level, but we do find ourselves in the midst of a pandemic and in the midst of a summer of unrest. And there is that sense of uncertainty. And no matter what we might think, this pandemic of COVID-19 
has, I think, fundamentally changed and is still fundamentally changing us as individuals, but also as a society. I think deep down we know, even if we don't want to admit it, that we cannot simply go back to the way things were. I mean, even in terms of our community of faith, COVID-19 has, I think, changed and will probably dramatically change how we are church in our community. I suspect our worship services will never be quite as big as they once were. We have added sort of new ways to the ministry of our congregations, primarily by putting services online. And now that we have begun that, I can't imagine not doing that again or continuing to do that for the indefinite future. Those might be kind of simple, straightforward ways, but there are probably countless others that we will discover as time goes on to the point where we know we can't simply go back to where we were before. Those institutions are no longer viable for maintaining the status quo and a world that has changed. But that doesn't mean we throw out sort of the tradition that we've had. Just like Isaiah couldn't throw out that long held tradition of Jerusalem and the promises God had made to the Davidic dynasty, we can't simply just throw out our own tradition, but we can transfer that into a new way, sort of as Isaiah has done. And in so doing, we will be able to perhaps see the new ways that God is fulfilling the divine promises and the divine purpose in our world. Amen. Lord, whose love in humble service bore the weight of human need, who upon the cross forsaken worked your mercies perfect.
to the child of youth, the aged, love in living deeds to show. Hope and health, good will and comfort, counsel, aid, and peace we give. That your servants, Lord, in freedom. Confident of your care and help by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. You take resources that appear to be meager, bless them, and there is enough. May your church trust that what you bless and ask us to share with the world is abundantly sufficient. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your bountiful creation offers sustenance and life for all creatures. Protect this abundance of the well-being of all. Reverse the damage we have caused your creation. Replenish groundwater supplies. Provide needed rains in places of drought. And protect forests from wildfires. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You offer yourself to all the nations and peoples of the earth inviting everyone to abundant life. Bring the prophetic vision to fullness that all nations will run to you and that nations who do not know you will find their joy in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Hear the anguish of tender hearts who cry to you in suffering and satisfy their deepest needs. Bring wholeness and healing to those who suffer in body, heart, soul, and mind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You offer freely the fullness of salvation. Give our congregation both hope and grace such a welcoming heart that our words and actions may extend your free and abundant hospitality to all whom we encounter. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. You gather your saints as one, united in the body of Jesus. Bring us with all your saints to the heavenly banquet. Remember that with love and thanksgiving, the saints we have known. Lord, and your mercy, hear our prayer. And the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And let, gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you now and forever. Amen. Empowered by Jesus to participate in God's work with our community, go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God. <laughs>